she almost got a standing ovation right at the beginning. So maybe we'll note to its audience at the end. Um, I'm Amy McDonald, director of City Space. Welcome to our in-person and our virtual audience. All of our programs have a hybrid audience as we are in these strange times. So our, our listeners who want to l listen in the comfort of their own home can do so. Um, a uh, few housekeeping notes quickly. Um, do keep your masks on, uh, uh, except when you're not eating or drinking. Please silence your cell phones. If you have questions, we'll be taking them throughout the hour. Just go to slido.com, and the hashtag will be up there um, is uh, Abedin, hashtag Abedin, A-B-E-D-I-N. If I've got it wrong, it will be up on the screen. And there was, oh, and Brookline Booksmith is in the lobby selling signed copies. Unfortunately, Huma has to leave right at 7 o'clock for another event, but she has signed copies, so if you'd like to purchase a book, please do so. Um, I was sharing with Uma that I actually met her in 2004. I was, ran the programs at the Kennedy Library, and at the time, Senator Hillary Clinton had written a book, and she was coming, and she was not feeling very well. And so she was in a special room at the library, and there were some kind of important people around her. And Uma was the person, Huma was the person who I was kind of assigned to. We were surrounded by aides and VIP people and muckety mucks. And I never forgot her because she was so kind to me. She was so patient and kind and put me such at ease. And I, I'll just never forget that. And so um, I don't know why I get so emotional telling that story, but just real kindness around some very important people. Um, we have our Radio Boston host, Tiziana Deering, who's going to engage Uma for the hour. And I know this is going to be a wonderful conversation. Thank you for coming. Welcome. Thank you. Glad to have you here. So uh, I'm not going to do the usual bio, but I, I want to I want to set this up because at one level you are career woman, wife, mother, um, public leader. I would argue, although I would also argue your book suggests you wouldn't see yourself that way. Uh, famously private person, but there's this other layer: two decades of public service. Uh, White House intern, your senior year of college. Uh, you meet Hillary Rodham Clinton and wind up um, beginning sort of doing her scheduling and over time becoming uh, an aide, a trusted advisor, or arguably a Clinton whisperer. Um, you follow and are a part of her team through uh, being First Lady, the United States Senate, two bids for U.S. Presidency, the State Department. And then in there, fall in love, uh, get married, get divorced, become a wife, a mother, a political wife, a political mother, and a woman who experiences public scandal, uh, not by your doing, and lives publicly through that, also not by your doing. And when you look at that in its totality, I think it's a story of a survivor. And I'm hoping that we'll touch on all of those pieces. But I want to start with your name, actually. Um, and we're going to put a little bit of text from the book up here, where you are fishing <laughs> with John McCain and Lindsey Graham in Alaska, if I recall. That's right. You're learning how to fish. You did catch I that did day. I did catch, yes. But um, they're fighting over how to pronounce your name. Yes. And Lindsey Graham is clearly saying, Huma. <laughs> And John McCain is saying, no, 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 I've got it. It's Huma. And you say, actually, not quite either. Um, and as a woman whose name has been famously mispronounced for her entire life, <laughs> I want you to say the whole thing for everyone here. Correct Lindsey Graham and John McCain once and for all. So first of all, I don't know where you were when I started researching or writing this book. She just summarized. <laughs> My entire, my entire story, and for those of you who have not read the book yet, the first uh, night that I did an interview, I was on Stephen Colbert, and he mispronounced the title of the book. It was fun. As both and a life in many words. Yes. And it is many words, but the book is called A Life in Many Worlds. Yeah. Um, so thank you for that, you know, yeah. uh, that summary of, of my entire life story. 
If you listen to the audio, which I, um, I did myself and I really enjoyed um, uh, taping, and actually my friend Jackie is here and was saying she's actually listening to the audio. She bought the book and is now listening to the audio. In the book, as I read it, I go through all the different ways that people pronounce my name. So my name is a Persian name. It actually is pronounced properly as Homa, H, like a short U, but most people have a hard time pronouncing it. So I absolutely respond. Well, I respond to both Hiuma and Huma and Uma. I pretty much respond to everything, but the proper pronunciation is Homa. And how important is your name to who you are? I think I'm one of those few people, at least in politics, that doesn't have to use their last name. I just go by my, I just introduce myself by my first name. And if you're in democratic politics, at least if you were in democratic politics in the last 20 years, you're like, oh yeah, yeah, I know who you are. I didn't have to get through my second name, which is, um, which is complicated mm -hmm. enough. But I will say, uh, and this has not come up in any of my other interviews, when I was having my own child, um, I did decide that I wanted him to have a more universal name because I had spent so much of my life saying my name and then pronouncing it again and then spelling it and then repeating it. Um, so I, I spared him that. All right, so I was gonna go there later, but we're gonna go there now. Since so you there. just talked about, I mean like Beyonce gets to just have a first name, right? <laughs> And you have just a first name here, and people in democratic circles know you. And it was one of the things that I thought was fascinating and that I struggled with in the book, is this idea at the same time that you are a woman behind the scenes who is of service to another very powerful woman. And yet it was almost like you didn't want to admit to the level of power you have. And that is at one level, I mean, Oscar de la Renta designed your wedding dress. That does not happen for the average person. You actually do just get to go by your first name and not your last name. And you weren't at the podium, but you were right there next to the podium. You know, I think one of the reasons I survived as long as I did, and, and survived is probably not the right word, but I think I really endured and, and enjoyed the life that I was able to live in public service because I never um, mistook the power I worked for as my power. Uh, I recognized that, you know, I haven't, um, until Amy shared that story, and I was happy that um, she did share that story with me because uh, in the book, I write about uh, the first job I had in the White House, and that was to do advance. And I believe that if you learn how to do advance in any profession, it's not just for a politician, I think it pretty much prepares you to do any job in the world because for somebody like me as a 21-year-old uh, intern who walked into the White House in 1996, um, you were often the first person, I would say to anybody I trained later, that you really are the ambassador who are, for whoever that principal is, whether it's the President of the United States or the CEO of a company. And those moments, those singular moments, actually mean something to people. Um, in fact, I have a whole story in the book about the, the, the woman on, who lived on the lake who we couldn't figure out really did not like Hillary and we couldn't figure out why and, and it turns out we basically invite ourselves to spend the night at her house and, uh, and Hillary swims in her freezing lake and we find out later it was that she thought she had a bad seat at the White House. Tracy, can you believe this? And Tracy, who I'm gonna totally embarrass here, my dear old friend, a member of Hillary Land, but Tracy was actually that for me. She, when I started as an intern, intern at the White House, she worked in the White House social office and I was totally insecure, totally didn't know what I was doing. And I remember the first event that I went to, actually the Chicago Bulls came to see the president. Do you remember this event? Or like some, I think it was like the Chicago Bulls that came and I didn't know what to do or how to, and I went and asked Tracy, I said, is it okay if I do this? And she said, yes, and, and I still remember, and I got this photo, and it's crazy that 26 years later, you remember that kindness, that connection, that one sort of act of outreach that somebody in power um, does. But I never mistook that for mine. I always knew I was on the periphery, I was the invisible person on the sidelines of the main person, and that that was never me. So what was your power? I'm not sure that I had, what I did, what I know, what I knew is I was prepared to outwork everybody in my environment. For those of you who haven't read the book, I am 
the product of two immigrant parents, an Indian father, a Pakistani mother, um, who left their countries uh, in the 60s. For them, education was a religion. They met at the University of Pennsylvania. They were both Fulbright scholars, fell in love, got married, moved to Kalamazoo, Michigan. And yes, there is a place called Kalamazoo, Michigan. Every time I do an interview with a European uh, interviewer, they're like, is there really a place in your country called Kalamazoo, Michigan? Yes, there is. And, um, and they, I was, that's where I was born. And when I was two, my, my father um, was diagnosed with renal failure and told he had five to 10 years and to get his affairs in order. And it was one of the first lines I wrote in my book, which is my father was told he was dying. And so he went out and he lived. And two months later, we moved to Saudi Arabia. And my parents raised us to be curious about the world, to explore the world, to travel to different countries, to learn about other cultures, countries, and religions. I was that eight-year-old kid that my father put on the phone to call the airlines to see what the flight from Jakarta to Indonesia was, giving me that sense of confidence in, I mean, I think on the one hand, he didn't know how long he had. And so to some extent, I think he was teaching us how to live without him. But he really gave me that sense of confidence and belief that I could be whatever it is that I wanted to be. And to come from a country and culture where there was really three things you could be, Tiziana, mm -hmm. if you were a man at least, a doctor, a lawyer, an engineer. And if you're a girl, you were a teacher, but mostly it was to prepare you. Not the marriage. doctor, not the lawyer, not the engineer. Not any of those things. And my parents were like, you can do whatever you want. We only have one requirement and that is that you be educated. I think having that grounding, having a father who would tell me as a child that your eyes are at the front of your head for a reason, which is to look forward. So to learn history, to understand what has happened in our world, but really just to inform the decisions that we would make going forward. And I think that gave me a confidence and a sense of perspective about the world when I walked into the White House as a senior at George Washington University. And I believe me, do appreciate the irony of the fact that I'm at Boston University. I'm thrilled, by the way, to be here, to be hosted by you, by WBUR. I'm so excited to be here. I almost came to Boston University, but I never quite made it when I was touring uh, schools. Uh, we went to George Washington University first, and the minute I walked in, I thought, all right, this is home, and, and the rest is history. But so that power is confidence, it's tenacity, it's you were willing to work harder than anybody else in the room. It was the dedication to education. And honoring, and I think a big part of that power is really my legacy and the past. I, I opened the book um, with my grandparents and my parents' story. And one of the things I reflect a lot, in, uh, I reflect on a lot in my book is the power of choice. And sure, I've worked for two um, uh, American presidents, tremendous honor in my life, and they made decisions all the time that affected millions of people around the world. But I think about the power of a single person's choice, and I write about my grandmother um, growing up in India in the early 1900s at a time when girls were not sent to school to be educated, and she demanded to go to school. And the deal that she cut with her parents, because back then it was shameful for a girl to be seen leaving her home every day. So she would have to leave from the rear of the house on an ox cart, in a covered ox cart. So a girl would not be seen leaving the house, but she would be educated. And I think of what she fought for. And every time, Tiziana, I have walked up those steps on Air Force One, that I have found myself in places and spaces of privilege. I recognize that I'm only in those places because of her and that journey that she took, that she passed on to my mother, that my mother passed on to me so much of my life is wanting to honor that legacy, that history. And if you read the book, you know, my father died right before I left for GW. Um, really, to me, uh, it's a love letter to my dad. I opened the book uh, uh, with a, a, a note I found uh, my, that my dad wrote, and it's a love letter to my dad that if I could have one more conversation with him today and say, this is what I've done with my life, and I hope you're proud of me. What do you think he'd say? I would hope he would say that he is very proud of me. So let's stay with family for a minute. As I was reading the book, I mean, it's a, there are so many parallel journeys in the book. Uh, and one of the things that I found myself thinking about it, and we'll come back to the fact that I read the book as you are involved in two committed relationships, one with your husband and one with Hillary Rodham Clinton. There's two committed relationships that sort of define much of the book and much of your life. But I want to start with family. You start the book with family, and that was clearly a choice, right? Because you are rooting your story in that history.
And I found myself wondering, so who is your family? And I don't mean by that, describe your family. I mean literally, for you, who do you count as family? You mean an actual human being or like a thought? No, I mean the people in your world that it, you count as family. It is, well, first and foremost, it is the nine-year-old I'm going to go home to tomorrow. Um, when I take that 7 a.m. shuttle, there's no question in the world. Um, you know, I acknowledge my ex in the book and people are surprised, but some people are surprised, not everybody. But, you know, he gave me the single most important thing in my life, which is my son. Uh, the greatest gift, the reason I live and, you know, have joy and happiness and hope um, in my life. I think um, I grew up, and I think this might be a little bit of an East versus West thing, to grow up in the Middle East, to grow up in a community, we have, there's a word for it actually. So when you're raised in the Middle East, there's this, the, what is called the ever-present community, which is the Ummah. Let's put that up. And the Ummah is a place and a space where there's always support, there's always security. If there's a wedding, you go and celebrate, and if there's a funeral, you, you participate, you mourn together. And um, I had that growing up. In fact, I tell a story in the book that when my father got his kidney transplant, because the doctors in Kalamazoo were correct in exactly 10 years, my father's kidneys failed, and my, my, he was lucky enough to get a, a transplant. And my mother had to go to fly to New York, leave Saudi Arabia, and leave me and my two young, my, my sisters. We were, I don't know, 11, 9, and 7, something like that. Um, and. Uh, our family friends in Saudi Arabia called my house and said to my mother, well, you have to go to the United States for God knows how long to be with your husband for his kidney transplant. Why don't we have the children move in with us? And I remember we were so scared of any more change. We already didn't know what was going to happen with our dad. And so my mother makes we said to my mom, we don't want to go anywhere. And so my mother makes up this excuse and says, well, the girls have their school exams coming up and all of their bookshelves and their desks are at home, so they're just going to stay at home. And the next morning, there's a knock on our door. And it's this guy with a moving truck. And he's like, I'm here to move desks and like bookcases. <laughs> and sure enough, like we moved into our family friend's house with all of our school supplies and desks and bookcases. And that's just the kind of environment that I had. So for me to go from that family to land in Hillary Land, and there's a whole chapter in the book called Hillary Land about this club, as I say, that comes with lifetime membership an environment where the culture was all about not just your professional development, not just this wasn't an environment of women, and it wasn't just women, but mostly women, who all created a table where there was enough seats to pull up more chairs. These were women who, as they climbed the rungs and climbed up that ladder, they reached to the lowest of us to pull us up to, and to have a sense of, you know, I say, I write in the book, you know, Hillary Land is a place where it's all about how can I help you with your resume? How can, you know, how can we do a better job? Do you need help with that trip? You should talk to my allergist. How is your mother feeling? <laughs> and the culture in Hillary Land is all of those things because Hillary Clinton is all of those things. And so that to me really was, a, you know, a community. But nothing is like your family. And my mother and my siblings and, you know, throughout the book, I, I talk about my faith and um, my family, because to always have that. And I, I write about the choice that I, I made. I, there's a whole chapter called Calling White House Signal. And Tracy, it was w one day when Katie Button calls me and says, as I just started working in the First Lady's office, and I get a call saying, and I was at a family wedding. I was going into a family wedding, and they said, um, the First Lady's going to Argentina. Do you want to go and advance this trip? I didn't know what advance was, by the way. And I had a choice. Stay, go to the family wedding or leave, and got on a plane to Argentina. And I got on that plane to Argentina, and I called it, you know, my fork in the road, and I always picked work. And I think it's one of the things, if I go back, it's the one thing, and I write that in the book, is my father always told me a good life is a balanced life. Yeah. Um, and I was not good with balance. It was always work first and everything else second. So I have many more questions, but I do want to remind the audience that you have an opportunity to ask questions okay. as well. I'll, I'll give you shorter answers. No, that's okay. We're, we're, we're just riding this along. So you go to Slido, and the, it's hashtag. And I've always heard Abedin. Uh, am, I, uh, am I saying that last name? You've yeah. got me incredibly Abedin. insecure about that's name right. pronunciation. No, it's all good. All right. Yes. So you can go here to slide.do, hashtag Abedin, and ask questions, and we'll curate them and get some of your questions worked in as well. So I, I want to stay, well, there are like 8 million places I want to go. 
Um, let's stay in Hillary land for a little bit, and we'll come in and out of Hillary land over the remaining time. It did strike me you were in a committed relationship with her. Um, and it, I almost, wa I did wonder if you were going to say she was family or not. A and I, I want to ask, part of it was work and the growth of work and the, the causes that you were dedicated to. But we don't stay with people like that unless we believe in people like that. So why did you believe so profoundly in this woman? So I ended up at the White House really by accident. Um, I was that young woman who didn't really know what she was going to do when she grew up. And then one day when I was 15, I was sitting on our living room floor in Saudi Arabia. It was the middle of the first Gulf War, Operation Desert Storm, and I see a face appear on TV. And I'd never seen anybody who looked like that on my TV, and it was Christian Amanpour, mm -hmm. who was um, then a, a, a war correspondent um, covering uh, the war, and I'd never seen anybody who kind of looked like me on TV, and that was it. I was going to be her. My goal, my dream was to be Christian Amanpour. I went to GW to be Christian Amanpour, and I joined a lot of students' associations um, at school, and a friend of mine was uh, interning for Mike McCurry, who was then White House press secretary, and she said, I'll get you an application, and I thought there's no better way than to become Christian Amanpour than to like go intern for Mike McCurry, except that I don't get placed in the press office. I get placed in the first lady's office. And you know, Tiziana, when I walked into the White House, I was not sure I was a Democrat. I mean, I, most of my family was Republican. It was pretty normal, certainly. Back in the 80s and 90s, a lot of um, South Asian families are socially and fiscally conservative. So you automatically registered as Republicans, which most of my family was. But what I felt was there was a mission. There was a cause. There was a mutual. There was a sense of purpose every day, something not just big was happening. Something really monumental was happening. I was working for a first lady who was traveling around the world championing women's rights. I was working for a president who was overseeing a robust economy. Back then, the United States was considered the sole superpower in the world. And so it felt like a, a place where a lot of amazing things were happening. But when, we, when they left the White House, I made a promise to myself. The day that I woke up and did not want to go to work is the day that I would give notice. And that was 25 years ago. And I think if I had a static job, if I did the same thing over and over again, I wouldn't have stayed so long. I think the opportunity of constantly trying new things, having um, greater responsibilities. I remember when she started writing her book, Living History, and I said, I want to work on this. I wasn't a writer. She's like, sure. I mean, you know, it, having you know, somebody who believes in you to some extent more than you believe in yourself, and I certainly found that in her. Um, it's very hard to, when you have that kind of a mentorship, a role model, somebody who really pushes you to do more, be more, um, it's hard uh, to leave that environment. And then, you know, crazy things were happening. Like, you know, these, she was running for president. There were these trips to, you know, these congressional delegations to Iraq and Afghanistan. I mean, really impactful, profound, important things were happening. And I saw her from a perspective a very, I believe, unique perspective, which is here with somebody who got up every single day and said, how can I make every man, woman, and child's life better? What can I do? And that sense of purpose and public service, I think, is something that, it is really something that connected us. And it's very hard to explain this to people. And I, you know, I closed the book uh, in part by saying, you know, if I, if I could go back, I would do it all over again. Because you cannot really describe that feeling of traveling around this country, which I had the great privilege of doing on more than one occasion, walking into town halls, into coffee shops, into high school gyms, carrying people's hopes, dreams, aspirations, fears, promises here. Knowing that if your candidate is successful, you can do something to help whoever you have met out in the world. There's a tremendous amount of, of, of responsibility and an affirmation that comes with the possibility and this excitement. And I haven't found that in, you know, anywhere else, um, in, in, my, in my humble opinion, anywhere else in, sort of in public, uh, in, sort of in, uh, in the professional world. It's really a very rewarding feeling. Do you think you're clear-eyed about her? Do I think I'm clear-eyed about her? Yeah. I mean. As a human being? As, as a human being, as a secretary of state, as a presidential candidate, 
So one of the things I try to do in this book, you know, I, I don't, you know, obviously I'm biased. <clears throat> I mean, I still work for this woman, I'm biased. <clears throat> I don't try to go around and say Barack Obama's amazing and Nelson Mandela did this and Princess Diana was this way and, you know, Bono said that. I don't try and tell you stories. I don't try to convince you somebody's amazing or somebody is not amazing. <clears throat> Michelle Bachman. I don't do that. <laughs> I just show you what it's like. I try to take my reader into those meetings, into that room before that Iraq war vote and what she was thinking and feeling and saying. It, on to those airplanes as we were flying to Cairo in the middle of Arab, in the middle of Arab Spring. What it was like with President Obama um, in any number of, of, of trips that we took with him. And I just try to show people what it was like, even the Middle East peace process that I write about in great detail at Camp David. The, the complexities, the, you know, the challenges that leaders were dealing with. And I let people judge for themselves. They can, you know, take away whatever they want um, from this story or not. But I just try to, I mean, I do tell some crazy stories, like when she fell and broke her elbow and we went to the hospital and I'm really queasy in hospitals and she takes off her jacket and it's so clear. That, and she meanwhile is like not betraying that anything is wrong with her and it's so clear the minute her jacket comes off that something really grotesquely wrong has happened to her elbow. <laughs> and it's bruised and, and sitting on the table for an x-ray. And the next thing I know, she's pointing at me saying, get her some juice, get her some water. She hasn't had any coffee. And I realize that I've actually passed out. And I'm now sitting in a chair. And her doctor, the whole medical team has left the secretary of state. And they're like trying to like make me feel better. And I had peed in my pants. I had fainted and peed in my pants all at the same time. So I really just try to, first and last time I've ever done that. Never done it since then. but. Um, <laughs> You know, we've had some great adventures. We've eaten, you know, crazy foods. We've traveled all over the world. We've had a lot of fun. So uh, clear-eyed is an interesting, um, an interesting word. I think I have just shared how I've experienced what it is like to work for her. One of the things that's interesting, you talk about taking people into the rooms, and maybe we can put up the Bin Laden um, text here, because this was an interesting time when you couldn't go in the room. Uh, and it was striking because so many of your stories are in the room, here's what happened. And you knew something really significant was happening because you couldn't go in the room. And that was really striking. We can look here. Um, uh, well, people can read it behind me. It's a little hard for me to read it from that direction. Uh, if there was anything more yeah. I needed to know, she would have told me. Later, you find out yeah. what had happened. President Obama announces the death of bin Laden. You could hear the note of vindication in her voice. And I was curious about sort of the coming into and out of this world of public policy decisions that do so profoundly affect so many people's lives. Um, and when that was gratifying, when that was unsettling, um, when there were moments where you wanted to just stand up and cheer, hell yeah, I totally agree with that, you didn't, or because of the role you were playing, or stand up and say, hell no, I totally don't agree with that, but maybe didn't because of the role you were playing. And so I was really curious about your inner journey as you watched policy that affected so many people's lives unfold. And I would love to hear you talk a little more about that. So it is one of the reasons I actually go, <clears throat> I'm not a policy person. I was never, you know, I never played a policy role uh, in her life then and now. But it is one of the reasons I do share uh, in the book exactly what it was like um, to be uh, on the outside, uh, in, the, in the room, but really sort of uh, on the outside. I did not know about bin Laden, but really nobody knew uh, about bin Laden. She is a bit of a vault, I will say. I is mean, she? you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. If you, if you, there, there are some times that I will say something to her. It's like, oh, I've known that. It's like, how did you not tell me that? She's like, well, you know, Tiziana asked me not to say, so I didn't say. So even though we, we, we do spend, we do spend some time gossiping. Sometimes she, she definitely, she definitely is a vault, and that was a whole different level um, with Bin Laden. And I didn't guess at all, not even close. I knew something was going on, but you know, there was always something going on uh, when you're working for the Secretary of State. There's always something on fire around the world. But having this different perspective, coming into the White House in 1996, 
there weren't a lot of people who looked like me. There weren't a lot of people that had my background. There were not a lot of Muslims there. And um, it is why I think I was deployed in the way I was deployed, because it was an environment where there was a curiosity about what I knew and what I could share and what it was like to be Muslim, to go into the conference room and pray. And Milan, our chief of staff, would walk in, see me there, and just walk out and give me privacy. And there weren't a lot of people, other people doing I was the only person. Uh, doing it there. Or, or you know, uh, I tell a story, I tell several stories in the book, but I was sent to the King of Morocco's funeral, and uh, I was staffing a trip to the Netherlands um, when King Hussein of Jordan died, and he was a very beloved leader in that part of the world. And, uh, and my colleagues call me and say, get on the plane, you're coming with us to that funeral, because we know this is going to mean a lot to you. I was at Camp David. I was sent to go in advance um, uh, the trip to Israel. But I do write throughout the book all the different markers, the moments in time that you saw how my faith in particular and people from my part of the world really slowly kind of turn into the boogeymen into this country, sort of marking the bombings in Africa when President Clinton, in 1998, when President Clinton was president, the bombing of the USS Cole in 2000, obviously, um, you know, the, the beginning of the war on terror um, with 9-11, I, I write how torn I was, and not torn, really torn up inside uh, the, in the period leading up, leading up to the Iraq vote, because those of us who had some connection to that part of the world had obviously you know, opposed, and I shared the story of my Syrian friend calling me and saying, I hope Hillary's going to vote against this. And that's why I write, I quote her speech, because essentially she gave a very nuanced speech because what she said is do everything short of going to war, but I am giving you authority. Basically what I'm saying is I trust my president. Um, and that war is, I think is pretty universally agreed to now is a mistake. And look at the price that we've paid. I was uh, with a, a group of Afghan women leaders yesterday and to see what's happened in Afghanistan. Uh, another, you know, another place in space that we spent a lot of time, money, investment, lost lives. Um, yeah, these are very personally hard um, things to have to contend with, and I don't um, have any hesitation with ever, you know, sharing my perspective. My boss has certainly heard it; she's welcomed it. But I'm not the, you know, I'm not the person in the hot seat. I'm not the person who has to make those choices and decisions. And I think one of the many reasons uh, I believe my boss is such a good leader and would have been a great president for this country is that she's always seeking broad perspectives. She always wants to hear more ideas and, and, and differing opinions and in the end makes her own judgments and decisions. And I think that has all the hallmarks of a good leader. Let's talk about a family and marriage, um, which is a hard, it's striking because there is, it's such an intimate part of the book. You are completely, it feels like now, I don't know your life, so I don't know how completely transparent you actually are because I'm not on your side of it, but it feels very transparent. It feels very open. Um, and in many places, very painful. And in other interviews you've done, when people have said, why did you write the book? You have said, well, it was great therapy to write the book. And I, that, that makes sense when one reads, especially the second half of the book. But then I found myself thinking, OK, but you could have written it and put it in a drawer. And it would have been great therapy. You didn't have to publish it, right? And you're putting yourself through something, publishing it after you write it. So instead of, why did you write the book? Why did you publish it? Why did you decide to share this story, especially that part of the story, again? It sounds like you never wanted to be dragged into sharing that story publicly in the first place. Well, first of all, I think it's a great story. Um, and I opened the book by saying I grew up surrounded by stories. I, I come from a family of storytellers, people, writers. Uh, I, I write that I think my father always believed uh, I would be an author. I, 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 he would travel around the world, but particularly to, to the US and, and the UK, and he would always bring us books back. And when I was 10, he gave me Silas Marner that he brought back from a trip to London. And I was 10, did not understand the material. It was way over my head, except I read the introduction and saw that George Eliot was, in fact, Marianne Evans. And I go to my father and say, I don't understand. 
why did she have to use a man's name? And he said, well, in the Victorian era, women were not taken seriously as writers, so she had to use a man's name. But don't worry, when you grow up and you write your story, you will use your own name and everyone will take it seriously. And I carried that with me. I think um, I've tried to share in the book the number of people that, who have reached out to me uh, since particularly my personal life has spilled out into the, into the press. And in part, I do believe things happen for a reason in life. Maybe that's a fatalistic way of looking at the world, but I do. And so if I had to go through all of this, and if maybe there is one person, five people, 10 people, it helps to hear about the journey, whether that is feeling completely terrified of doing something in your life. Because one of the things I say at every, and I spend a lot of time at universities, they're, they're my favorite places to go and do in events. And um, I say the same thing, which is I have chosen to do um, the thing that scares me the most. Which is? And that's this. I am speaking publicly. I am out in the world. I am one of those people who's terrified, of, terrified of public speaking. Um, and if I can do this, I think I can pretty much do anything. I'm the same age as my father was when he was given uh, five years to live. And so to me, it's, it's less about, you know, why, why I have to answer this question of why do you need to write your story? Why do you have to publish it? I, you know, I, don't, I cannot think of a man who's asked that question, first of all, um, but that's okay. Uh, like, you open up Andre Agassi's book and the first thing he says is, I hate tennis. And no one's like, no, why'd you write your book? It's like, of course he's gonna write his book because he's, not that I'm comparing myself to Andre Agassi, I'm a huge fan, but um, he's, he's a great story. He has a great story. My epilogue got cut because the book was so long, but I did write that I found a lot of, um, uh, strength and inspiration reading other people's stories, and whether that is Andre Agassiz or, um, or Shonda Rhimes or Elizabeth Lesser, who wrote this great um, autobiography or memoir uh, called uh, Marrow. All these stories really move me forward. So if I can contribute to that space and place, uh, I love that I can do that. And the, one of the real reasons in the end I wrote my story, I've said this a lot on the book tour, and, and maybe you've heard this already, but right after the 2016 campaign, uh, a friend of mine took me to dinner, and the first, she was trying to help me figure out what to do next, and she said, you should write your story. And I wanted to go back to being invisible and hiding in the back of the room. Just wanted the whole world to, like, open up and just be swallowed. Um, and she says, but it's a good story. You should write your book. And I said, no way. I go tell Hillary. Anna says I should write my book. And Hillary says, great idea. And I still think it's a terrible idea. And it was only many months later when I was getting professional advice, and I told somebody I was writing my book, and they asked me why. And I said the same thing. Well, people are saying it's a good story. And he said, I don't know why you would do that. I'm not sure people want to hear any more about that scandal. Mm -hmm. And it was when somebody really, and he wasn't the only, several other people had said this to me too. I think it was when somebody, and maybe this is a female, this is like a Y chromosome thing, is that when somebody tells you you can't, or more of it was that it was, that there was, that I was unworthy, that it was not, or that that's all that my story was, that, that I wanted to maybe disprove that. Maybe I did want to take back my history that clearly somebody else is writing. And if you think that you can summarize my history as one word and that scandal, I, that is unacceptable to me. And so this is me taking ownership. Yep. So I think, thank you. <laughs> And I will tell you, I think the reason it's good to ask the question, right? Because you challenged me there. You're like, sister, you would not have asked Andrea. I see that, right? <laughs> so, and let's well, do I mean, that. But I think part of the reason that it's a good question is, it is, it's 500 pages, but it's not your whole world. It's not your whole life. And to understand where the, the book ends where you stop writing the book. Yes. The journey is what's happening now after. That's right. As well. And in watching your interviews, you know, and in watching you talk about it, as you say, as somebody who's afraid of public speaking, for example, there's this follow-on journey, right? Mm -hmm. Answering these questions now, talking about it now, um, and living it twice. I mean, I, I don't think there's a person in the world who hasn't been through hell and back about something. And the first time we go through it, we don't have any choice. But to live it again is something else. 
And I think what I'm hearing from you there is somebody's telling that story, so you should get to tell it. Well, and I think also it, it helps you understand. I agree, I agree with everything you just said. And I think it also, I needed, I did not understand, you know, what was happening to me. I didn't understand. And as I said, um, and I apologize, I've already said this earlier this evening, but I don't think what I went through was all that singular. I think a betrayal and heartbreak and loss and devastation unfortunately happens to too many people on this planet. I just had to do it on the front page of the newspaper and I had to navigate my way through it and it took me, it took me many years and I was somebody who exerted a lot of control in every aspect of her life, certainly at work and, and at home and over myself and my body. Anthony was my, Anthony was my first love. He was the first man I was ever with. I mean, I opened the chapter with waking up at Buckingham Palace. I lived this dream life. It was extraordinary. And so to all of a sudden have this shock to my system and then the years of, as I write in the book, asking over and over again, why? Why is this happening? And not understanding it, really writing it, you know, I had to do the hardest thing because I went to a very low place. And you've asked me about family and what family means and what community means. But I went to a very isolated, low place. There's two chapters in the book. One's called Shame, Shame, Go Away. The other one is called Elephant in the Room. Because I think a lot of people who are in situations similar to me, whether it doesn't matter if you're a public person or not, you feel judged by your family and your community sometimes. You don't know what the right choice is. And for me, I tried, I opened the book with a letter from my father, which is, I just tried to make every right choice as things were happening. And I didn't always know what that was. I was trying to find my way a lot of the time. And the, you know, the letter that I opened the book with from my father, I found it after he died just in his diary. And it says, you know, let others do what you will. You are responsible in the first instance to yourself, your principles and values and to your God. And everything else is, you know, it'll, it'll sort itself out. And so I, I really enjoyed, I enjoyed the writing and I'm, um, and I'm enjoying the book tour. So, <laughs> so I want to put a little bit of uh, material up here and I want to start with, let's do the emails because we have a listener question that I think. Wait, which emails? Like actual now? No, 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 from, from the them. book. It, it, that's, oh. our, that's our shorthand <laughs> cue. No, 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 it's okay. That's our shorthand cue for pieces from the book. Oh, that we pulled, yeah. Right? And we have the top one here, oh, yeah. right? No matter how hard I tried, whether, whether it was to help Anthony, to threaten him, to sympathize him, to ignore him, to throw him out of my house, it was impossible to move on. This man was going to ruin me. Now he was going to jeopardize HRC's chances of winning the presidency. And then later, Anthony, I said, wanting to shake him through the phone, if she loses this election, it will be because of you and me. That night, I wrote one line in my notebook. I do not know how I'm going to survive this. Help me, God. We have an audience question that says, you've gone through so much. And I think this underscores that. Why would you consider even, this says, why would you even consider blaming yourself for HRC election loss or James Comey? So I shared moments as I was going through them in real time. And in that moment, I mean, it was such a shock. It was such a, came out of nowhere. It was so unprecedented. Um, yeah, I did, I did uh, carry that responsibility, that sense of guilt for a long time after the election. It's, uh, it's hard not to. And, and I'm sorry, I should give some context for those who don't know close to the election date. 11 days before. Right. Well, you can do it. It's your story. Well, 11 days before. So at the beginning of the campaign, right when Hillary announced she was running for president in 2015, um, the FBI announced that they were launching an investigation into her use of emails, um, not using State Department emails, and that, which other people had done before and other people would do after, but they were investigating her, and it turned out to be a year-long investigation. The investigation concluded... Uh, in the summer of 2016, and then 11 days before the election, uh, the FBI announced, um, uh, sent a letter to Congress essentially saying that they had found some emails between me and Hillary on a uh, laptop of Anthony's uh, that had been confiscated uh, by the U.S. attorney in New York. It's complicated. It's all in the book. But um, that they were reopening the investigation. And it was big news, and usually you don't make big news like this so close to an election so that it doesn't sway the election. Um, but they did, and uh, it was 11 days before. 
And they were also investigating the other campaign, just FYI, did not say anything public uh, about that. And then two days before the election, a second announcement comes and says that, uh, and the announcement was essentially the investigation's closed again, we've looked at everything. And there's nothing to see there. And what was so shocking is that if they had called us, I mean, we were cooperating, obviously, in this investigation for the full year, we would have said, look at everything, see, you know, take a look at whatever you want. So it was a real, it was a real shock, it was a real surprise. And in an election that was so close, with every little thing mattering, every little thing mattered, this was a huge, huge thing, and it caused an earthquake uh, very close to the election, and uh, certainly uh, contributed um, uh, quite decisively uh, to her loss. So, I'm And I want to note, I mean, even though 3 million more people voted for her, it was the 77,000 votes in the three states uh, that made all the difference, because we don't vote for presidents based on the number of people who vote. It's the electoral college that determines. So, and I'm, I'm making a conscious choice on this one because that's something that we could dive a lot more into. And I'm mindful of how much time we have here. And I think there are those who would love to dive more into that. But that's been dove in into a million times. And there's other parts of this story that have less so, that have to do with um, being a woman, being a wife, uh, forging your way ahead after a pretty profound betrayal. I mean, Anthony was being investigated at that time for, uh, as I understand it, the crime that he eventually pled guilty to, um, uh, having to do with uh, an exchange with an, a, a girl who was not yet a woman. And what strikes me in all of that, and wanting to talk to you about that, is I want to know how responsible, how accountable a woman should be held for something her husband does. And I'm interested, as someone who's had to live through that, we've seen so many women over the years who are in public leadership whose husbands, including the one you worked for, um, have done something and it spills into their lives, it spills into their world, it spills into their professional experiences. And there is a pattern there. And as a woman who's lived through it, I'm so interested in how you think about that. And, and do we get that right? Well, I'm not sure I'm the right person to ask because I don't think it's okay. And I am the person who was on the other end of it. And I share the stories in the book about being disinvited from parties, about being asked not to show up at charities, about being the woman with a scarlet letter on her chest. So yes, I have lived in that space and place, and it is not fun. And um, I, it got to a point where I was done with it. I recount that story in the book where I couldn't even take my son swimming in the same you know, pool with his father without a woman coming to me and saying, shame on you, and shaking her finger. And um, we do this as a society. We do this, and it's men and women. Uh, and. Uh, I'm not sure I'm the most qualified person because I've been on the other side of it, but... Doesn't that I, make you the most qualified person? I was raised to have a sense of radical empathy for other people. That is how my parents raised me, which is if there is somebody who is the other, you don't, you go into those conversations. You don't shy away from not trying to understand what the other person's perspective is, what they're feeling, and what they're going through. And then I came into a work environment where I was surrounded by that also. And so for me, sure, I can say it's not all right and you can't treat people that way, but we tend to, number one, I think in my 30s, uh, up until my 30s rather, you care a lot, especially as women, I think you care a lot about how other people judge you and perceive you and, you know, the slights are horrific. I mean, they do something to you. They really do something inside your sense of self-worth and self-confidence um, and, uh, you know, being prepared to walk into a room and being asked to leave. It's not, it's not something that one can prepare for or that uh, ever becomes okay. Um, but to me, I try to look at how you prevent these cycles from passing on to the next generation. It is one of the reasons why, you know, I wasn't even 12 weeks pregnant when the scandal with, um, you know, Anthony broke, and you just described some of his behavior. And 
I didn't understand it for a very long time. And even now on the book tour, as I talk to people, there are several people, both men and women, who will say to me, I just don't understand. And what I say to everybody I have these conversations with is, I used to be you. And frankly, I'm jealous of you. Because if you are somebody who does not have a spouse, a partner, a child, a parent, a sibling, or a loved one who is dealing with addiction or mental health challenges or some sort of compulsive behavior, then you don't understand. And I had to really go to the hardest, lowest place. And it was work I had to do with Anthony to understand that when people are in the throes of addictive behavior, they do all kinds of things that normally they would never even consider. And so I had to do the work. I had to respect the process. And it's, it's a really hard process. I had to learn that people went through a lot harder things than I've gone through. Um, and people will read the book and think that's you know hard, but there are. I mean, I, I was constantly conscious, I am constantly conscious of the privilege I have. I mean, I think about my father. I go back, I took my son back in 2018. Um, in 2018, I took my son home to Saudi Arabia and finally to pack up my father's closet. It's close, my, mother, my mother's house. Our house in Saudi Arabia is Miss Abisham's house. My mother doesn't throw out anything. Great expectations. Great expectations. <laughs> And I, I go into his closet, and as I started put, taking out his clothes to give them away, I noticed that on all of his undershirts, there was blood. And it was because he'd had his kidney transplant. And for years, he'd had so many procedures and the dialysis and needles. And I think of what I saw in my dad every single day. He was smiling. He was perfectly dressed. And frankly, I feel as though that was his final lesson to me 26 years later, which is there can be hope and joy despite the pain. You just had to have that approach to the world. And that is the approach um, I have to the world. As to how society, I changed the way society treats women who've been in positions like me. I don't think I can single-handedly do it, but I can definitively say it is not OK. And we have done it for a long time, and we continue to do it. And I write in the book just putting you know, aside my situation, is how hard it is for women in, in the public space um, to be seen, taken seriously, and as leaders, and certainly as executives. Forget commander in chief. Was there anything, when you went and cleaned out your dad's closet, was there anything? Like, so I'm having this picture as you're writing that part, and I'm like, I'm picturing the sweater that you're going to save for Jordan from your oh, father, yeah. <clears throat> but then you find blood on everything, right? Was there anything you were able to keep that you'll be able to give your son? Yes. Well, we kept his pipes. My dad was a big pipe smoker, so all the grandchildren get a pipe. And we kept... <laughs> I did not see that coming. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mike has pictures of the pipes, right, Mike? And um, yes. And, um, and we had some scarves. It was really just his undershirts. But you know, we, we, had, we kept his scarves and sweaters. We've kept little things. But you know, my father was not about hoarding. He was exactly the opposite. He had two pairs of ballet shoes black and brown, and he wore them out. You know, was, he, he believed that we should, you know, you should own only what you needed, you know, good quality, and when you were done using, you should give it away and replace it with one pair. And so um, his closet was immaculate, and he left, you know, he left this um, really pristine legacy. And um, it's one of the reasons why I try to share a lot about him in the book. If you can't tell, he's, he's, a big, uh, he's a big character in my book. So two last questions, one from an audience member and one from me. So from the audience member, what advice do you have for those who are struggling after difficult experiences or trying to move forward after a loss? Well, I always, uh, for myself, and what I like to share when people ask me is, I think it's OK to, it's okay to not be OK. And I think for a long time, I kept so much anger and bitterness kind of locked up inside. I didn't understand. And I didn't acknowledge that I wasn't OK. And it wasn't until I had a chapter that was called Letting Go, and I think it's now called Truth Hurts. But it's OK to let go of some of the, you know, the, the hurt, the anger, the guilt, but to allow yourself to feel. Because walling yourself off from the feeling, at least for me, it, it did not work. Um, but to experience the emotions and working through them and hopefully coming out on the other side, I certainly you know, have, have been lucky enough to do that. Um, it's worth putting in the work. And so my last question for you, when I finished the book, I thought, OK, what's your love story? Who's your love story? Well, his name is Jordan Zane. 
He is the young man who woke up at four o'clock in the morning and said, Mommy, where are you going? And I said, I'm going to Boston. And, you know, I just cannot, and it's something you just, you know, it's why I write the story about the whole experience of this child who kind of fell out of me like God. It, I, I share this, I haven't actually talked about this at all in any single interview, but I, my pregnancy was easy. I got uh, pregnant totally by accident, carried this child. He basically fell out of me. I was so blessed, so, so blessed. And I just think that he, he is my gift from God. It's whatever hardships you're going to have or I have put on you, I'm giving you this gift. And um, I have that gift. I'm so grateful to have that gift. And when you talk with him 20 years from now about these days in your life, what's the story you tell? That to have principles and values is an important thing to know that you are loved, that you are cherished, that you are supported no matter what you do. And I hope Jordan, when he's old enough, will read this book and come away feeling very proud of his mommy and also come away with a feeling of gratitude that, mommy, thank you for helping my trying to help my daddy too. I think that's important. I think, you know, the only way we try to understand some of this behavior um, in adult men is really not to, you know, I am trying to raise a son who grows up to respect women and not fear their power. And I think that's the only way we change how society um, treats women leaders. That's perfect. It's a perfect ending because <laughs> we're out of time. It's a great way to end. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. So I want you to, we're going to do this again. Join me in thanking Huma for sharing so much of her life story and her time tonight. Thank you, Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Um, as you know, she's got to leave quickly. Her memoir is for sale via our partners, Brookline Brooksmith, uh, out in the lobby afterward. Uh, City Space has more events for you this week as part of our curated cuisine series this Thursday. Magna Chakrabarty will interview Dory Greenspan about her new cookbook, mm. Cooking with Dory. I have made the, let's see, it's the cayenne pepper cornbread out of that cookbook. That's it's fantastic. <laughs> our partners at BU's Food and Wine Program are having their students bake cookies from the book. I'm hoping it's the World Peace cookies. They're fantastic. So register, eat the cookies, and come to the event later this week. And let's join one more time in thanking Huma for that. Thank you.